Hi, everyone. Hello. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope everyone's enjoying South by Southwest. And thanks again to Blockchain Creative Labs for having us on another great panel. Uh, today's panel is called NFTs and Physical Art, the Future of Collecting. My name is Rachel Wolfson, and I'll be moderating the panel today. I'm going to go ahead and briefly introduce our panelists. We've got John Swarbrook. He's an art specialist at Zero X Art. Hi, John. Marjorie Hernandez, she's the founder of Luxo and co-founder of The Dematerialized. And Brian Trunzo, Metaverse lead for Polygon Studios. And finally, David Feinstein, head of partnerships at Super Rare Labs. Okay, great. First question, what is the relationship we are seeing now between physical and digital art due to the rise of Web3? And anyone can go ahead and start with the question. I think it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, a year ago, it feels like forever, but uh, traditional collectors and artists kind of didn't take us serious, at least when they talked to us at Super Air. And just this year alone, or even this week, so many uh, dealers, collectors, and just what Zero X Art is doing, it's all culminating. And we're going to really see, I mean, we thought it grew fast last year, but this year is going to be insane. Yeah, I'd say I'd just reflect that. The crypto moves much more quickly uh, than my art world background. And, and I joined Xerox Art in uh, December. We've put together a wonderful exhibition um, which pairs physical artworks with what are called NFT deeds. Um, and what does an NFT deed mean? It's, it's containing the certificate of authenticity for the artwork. Um, and it's also having the provenance uh, encompassed within it and also the ownership rights. So it's quite a, a groundbreaking project. Um, and I'm looking forward to launching it on the 25th. You know, in the DeFi world, we often say that we're speed running Western finance. And uh, in the metaverse and on the art side of things with Web3, it just feels like we're speed running culture. You know, we're onboarding people who would have never been fans of art at such a rapid clip. It's just such an exciting time. Absolutely, and I think also kind of like the silos are breaking down. We used to have like very separate silos in culture, and right now we have a conversion around culture. And I think, you know, digital art or you know, power by technology was kind of like existing in a silo, and now we understand the technology one is there is inevitable that will start merging to other parts of a kind of like cultural consumption. So I think we're experiencing that convergence right now. Right, and based on that, how are we building that bridge between the physical and digital world when it comes to traditional artwork, when it comes to digital fashion or fashion? So how are we building that bridge right now? Um, well, in terms of the art world, and I imagine it's similar with fashion, um, I think the two worlds are merging more and more. I think the traditional art world is, is so open now, at least in my experience, to NFTs and to the opportunity it provides. Um, and for collectors, it's a no-brainer, really, because you can have your artwork on-chain. It's easily recorded. You, know, you can access the history of it in a click of a, a button. Um, and whereas in the, in the old art world, it was completely different <laughs> and very slow. And I'm sure it's similar in fashion. Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, it comes down to, as users, we won't see a distinction between digital world and a real world. Like, we just live in life, and we are merging both realities, and we're moving back and forth. And we just want to have access to the stuff that we like and the cool stuff in both environments, right? And the more time we're spending in a digital environment, and obviously we want to curate our digital life, our digital goods, our digital presence in the same way. So I think the ability of having an identity that allows you to move between both realities and have ownership between both and having that fluidity in terms of being able to trade a physical fashion piece against a digital sneaker and vice versa is kind of like a super powerful proposition. And I think as users, we don't see a distinction between when do I own what, where? Like it's just the stuff that I love and I want to access it and own it and trade it and profit from the advantages of owning that no matter in which reality dimension they exist, I guess. I think it's interesting that we can gamify art and wearables and, and anything uh, that can be classified as an NFT in a sense that we can reward people for collecting, right? Part, part of what is exciting and exhilarating for a collector is the hunt 
and then the reward thereafter. And usually the reward thereafter is simply clout, you know, putting it on display in your home, uh, and only so many people could see it in your home, uh, or selling it, right, and, and reaping a financial reward. Uh, but now creators can actually program the art and develop next-gen loyalty programs, essentially, for their community uh, to engage, to forge new NFTs, to qualify for whitelists or allow lists. Um, it's, just, it's just a new way of onboarding and gamifying collecting. Yeah, I think the cool thing, uh, typically the traditional art world, you worked through a gallery or like an agent or a manager, so you didn't have a direct connection with your collectors. So you weren't able to really interact and talk to them and hear what like they like about it and what the story is behind the works. Now an artist can work through a gallery. Like I think the big misconception is galleries are important aspect of this whole ecosystem. So at Super Rare, what we've been doing is like next or at the end of this month, we're gonna be partnering with uh, Tagliatella Galleries and we're gonna be doing a three or four, we're gonna bring our OG crypto artists and do secondary like auction evening and then they're bringing three traditional artists and we're gonna onboard them to Web3 and show them the power of this but it's gonna be like super rare and traditional big gallery partnering together to empower this whole art ecosystem. Right, I think that's a great example of how we're bridging that gap. John, I'd also like to get your insights because you're with Zero X Art so I'm wondering how you guys are bridging that gap from the traditional art world to the physical. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's really interesting to what David's saying about sort of digitizing and, and sort of putting things on chain is such a fascinating leap uh, for, for collectors. But I think in a way it's going to make, it's going to democratize collecting, right? So it's going to make it a lot easier for collectors to buy artworks on chain, physical artworks, trade them, keep them in a collection, show them in the metaverse or in, or, or in reality. Um, and I think the, the blurring of the two worlds is happening more and more. And I think with our, with our project, um, it's about reaching this new collector class who are interested in Picasso or Warhol or Banksy, but haven't made that leap yet. And it's just about merging the two worlds. So, Great, yeah. merging the two worlds. Uh, Marjorie and Brian, I know both of you are involved kind of with the digital fashion world. Can you talk a little bit about how we're bridging that gap between fashion and digital fashion? Yeah, totally. Um, I think, you know, what we see right now is a lot of like, we have like a community of digital creators who are creating digital fashion first, who 100% understand kind of like the space, the market, the opportunity, the future that we're looking into. And then you have like traditional brands trying to enter the space. And I think the challenge is, is understanding how a brand that existed in a reality confined by physics will translate into a completely new dimension. And I think that process of translating the ethos of the brand into a digital realm is kind of, kind of like a challenge, uh, but it's also like a super exciting opportunity. And I think, you know, for most of our advisors and fashion partners, we kind of like express to them that this is the first time the fashion industry is truly going through a transformation that is really, really significant because the fashion industry has been selling the same products since a very, very long time, and they're virtually on change. And I think, you know, for the consumer of the future, it would be very difficult to understand why a piece of leather is so much valuable if it has no utility beyond carrying stuff. And if you're not carrying stuff anymore because everything is digital, like why do you need that piece of leather for? And I think, you know, the way we see it is that digital fashion is obviously an amazing avenue for experience, but also the ability of creating digitals for physical garments that will give you also kind of like that experience and the ability to kind of like understand the history of the brand or of the product a bit better. So the way we see it is products without digital identities are like iPhones without batteries. They are not fun, nobody wants to have them anymore. So kind of like that's our proposition and that's what Luxo has been working on since the beginning, since we started is to basically have those key pieces in terms of identity for users, brands and creators to kind of like manage that ownership and issue, issue the goods. So I co-sign everything that Marjorie says. Um, one thing that is super interesting to me when it comes to digital wearables is this idea of ownership, right? It's, it oftentimes gets lost in the sauce. We don't actually talk about what ownership means. Um, but to date in video games, for instance, you know, if you own something within the game, you don't actually own it. It's a license to use it, and that license can be revoked for any reason. You can't transfer it. It's not actually yours. It's not digitally scarce. It's not provably scarce. Um, 
and this idea that someone can take it away from you is kind of odd, right? In the real world, it would be very strange if someone came to me and said, you're wearing my shirt at the BCL event. You can't do that. You can only wear that shirt on my platform. Take that shirt off. It's, it's not your shirt, right? That's kind of how things have been digitally. Um, but moving forward, that's no longer the case. And for me, that's the most exciting part about digital wearables specifically because it's an expression of yourself, right? Uh, fashion, both in this real world and also this nebulous concept of the metaverse that we're pacing towards. Um, so for me, the idea of ownership is just the core of wearables. 100%. And I think a funny thing that you said, if you guys check Vitalik Buterin, his .me website, he says his motivation to create Ethereum is because World of Warcraft deleted his favorite character. And he says centralization sucks. So that's the inception of us sitting here, I guess. Right. And I also wanted to just point out one thing to the audience that you said, Marjorie, fidgibles. That's physical and digital fashion that's kind of connected. And that's one of the building bridges that we're seeing now. Do you just want to elaborate on what that means really quick? Yeah, 100%. So when we created our, or wrote our white paper, we, you know, we defined the digital as being this, this product that lives in both realities. And it's like you can experience it in both places simultaneously. And then can be like either you start from a digital product that eventually gives you access to a physical one, or it's a physical asset that has a digital twin in terms of like authenticity, but also a, an asset that exists in a virtual environment. So it's kind of like a, in a way how we see the immediate future of consumption for like most people who not necessarily spend so much time in only a digital environment primarily, but it will be a way to like really understand like kind of how is that product of the future. So we are super strong believers in digitals. And I think that concept also applies to art when you are buying uh, that certificate that you were describing is basically taking that piece of physical art and make it into a digital or giving it like a digital life, right? That is so much fun. Like you can upgrade it, you can give you access, you can do things. It's kind of like when you buy a Tesla and then you get an upgrade. It's like your car got newer, so your piece of art and your piece of fashion gets newer even though it's old. So. Right, that kind of segues into my next question, which is what are the benefits of NFTs and what they can bring to the physical world? So let's talk about traditional art first. Absolutely. Um, so the experience, I mean, going back to a traditional art collector, um, the, the experience of buying art from a gallery is often quite chaotic. So you can buy a piece, you get a certificate in the post that could be lost. Uh, you could get a, an invoice which you need 10 years down the line and that's, <laughs> that's also lost and I've experienced that before. Um, whereas with, with having it all on the blockchain, it secures the artwork, right? So it's um, buying a physical one of one uh, on the blockchain means that you have access to your collection. Um, and I think that is, that is a game changer um, for both traditional collectors and also for crypto collectors, owning a Picasso on chain. I mean, just imagine it's incredible. Um, so I think that's, that's the technology that will sort of grow the art world a great deal. It's going to happen very quickly. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it's just pretty crazy. They, if you're an artist, like typically you would never think about being an artist as like a full-time career. And now you're able, I mean, we're watching artists become quitting their jobs every day in this like web two world to go do their, their passion dreams at, in any part of the world so i typically like uh, in the traditional art world too collectors like i never collected a piece of art and now i have 50 eth worth of art and my wife kind of laughs at me and says what the heck are you doing and it's all just on my phone um now anybody can be a collector you can go to OpenSea or to any platform and start collecting art from some random person and China or whoever you believe in, and it's, it's pretty much opened it up to where you don't have to be uh, part of a tradition, like a blue chip gallery or part of the invite list. Now it's opened up the ability for everybody to take part of this like movement. It's, it, just reflecting that, it's definitely broken down the barriers um, for, for collectors, as you say, you know, having to be on a list at a contemporary gallery. Uh, to acquire works maybe five years later or having to give your credit card details before you can bid. All of this, you know, it's being broken down um, and it's very exciting. Brian and Marjorie, did you want to talk about just more in depth about the benefits of fashion NFTs? I mean, there are so many discrete use cases that we can get into. So, so maybe I'll pick two and try to be quick with it and not hog the mic time. But 
You know, one is uh, the amount of waste in the fashion industry with sampling, right? Collections get sampled, and then they're presented to buyers at department stores and independent retailers. Uh, and it costs hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to do that. Uh, and it clogs up the supply chain, and oftentimes those garments are discarded. Uh, you know, we can do this digitally and then attach purchase orders to those uh, and basically use NFTs to represent these purchase orders and completely do away with the sampling process. Now, sample sales will go away, and people who like sample sales and get 80, 90% off on their clothing for designer gear, that will go away. But that, that's one interesting use case. You know, uh, another one is this idea of digital twins, um, whereby your physical item can actually level up your digital item. Meaning, if I had a digital twin of these shoes that was within the metaverse somewhere, and I wore these shoes here and collected a POAP that represented the fact that I wore them here, the NFT version within the metaverse can morph. It can be up-leveled and vice versa. We can do things like that. I, I think that's a very interesting concept that will allow for the gamification of brands, the likes of which we've never seen. Totally, and I think to what we are saying in terms of also of supply, like, like fast fashion represents like a real threat to the planet. And I think, you know, we have a desire to have new, beautiful, fun things to try. And I think the digital fashion market will absorb a big fortune of that fast fashion market in terms of like, if you want to explore, you want to have something funny, then you just go through that avenue. And also in terms of like brands understanding where's the desire of the consumer. Like there's so much overstock and stuff also from the luxury. Right, the stuff that gets burned, destroyed because it was not sold. And then I think understanding what is actually the desire of your consumer and producing those items, I think that's a super valuable proposition. Right, I also think that NFTs, artwork NFTs and fashion NFTs are opening the space up to new consumers because they're more accessible. So let's talk a little bit about that. If, if we're seeing more consumers enter these spaces because they have access now. Yeah, geography is always interesting, right? Just think of what Axie Infinity did for those who are living in poverty um, in the Philippines. Uh, the play to earn game, it gave them meaning within their lives and it gave them the ability to earn money. Um, you can sort of imagine, uh, you know, I'm no expert geographically on that region, but you could imagine that there might not be access to means of self-expression within those regions that perhaps they can be fulfilled within this concept of a metaverse by wearing wearables. Um, now, that can be AR filters for their Instagrams, right? Um, or that can be actual wearables within these multiplayer environments, these immersive, persistent environments that we call the metaverse. So I, I think it's, it comes down to ownership and self-expression and a means of empowering. I think those are the three pillars, really, of digital scarcity and, and blockchain-based fashion and art. 100% echo what Brian just said, but I think also in terms of like the talent having access to the market, like most of the most famous fashion and artists in the world right now come from the northern western atmosphere and not because people in the northwest are smarter than the rest of the planet it's just because they have access to the markets right? they have access to the schools they have access to the people who are giving the jobs so i think when you open the market and all of a sudden we can tap on those pools of talents that we didn't tap before. I think all of a sudden the next biggest designer might be a girl in Utopia or a boy in Sao Paulo who will have never had the chance to go to Paris and become the next fashion designer or go to you know Florence to go to art school. Like all of a sudden we're giving access. And I think that's the part that makes me the most excited about is that once something becomes digitized, we know it's accessible. So all of a sudden we could onboard a large amount of people who's being excluded kind of like cultural markets. And I think that's super exciting. So one of the things that uh, we're doing at Super Air is we're, we're about to run, uh, essentially let our artists that weren't ever in fashion that makes amazing art uh, create like all sorts of swag. Like so, they're gonna we're gonna be doing like jumpsuits, and some of our artists are designing. They're they're now taking their what you thought was just crypto art, and they are designing like a hoodie and hats and all this. And we're essentially working with a drop shipper to help get that created. But now. These traditional oh, artists are now going to be entering into fashion. We essentially remove the barrier of what it used to take to become a to 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 become into this space and all this. So it's pretty awesome. Right, John. I have a question for you. So why would anyone, in your opinion, want to buy an original Warhol or Picasso on chain rather than through an auction house? What are the benefits there? Um. <laughs> Well, for a start, the, the auction houses charge 
on top of the, the selling price. So, so that's that's one thing to consider. Um, but there's also, I mean, there's a lot about, as I was saying, um, about putting it on chain and having it um, everything um, within your wallet is such a fascinating and, and fantastic add-on um, for collectors. Um, and I think that. Um, more and more, it's, it's fascinating to think who the big collectors will be in 50 years' time. Um, and, and I think it will be very different um, to how it is now. I think it's more decentralized to speak to this point. But I think having it on chain um, makes it more, well, it's part of a community, right? So um, I think what's a big element of um, the blockchain is being able to show your Picasso, have these conversations, exhibit them perhaps. I mean, you can just imagine DAOs exhibiting works in 50 years' time. It's fascinating. So sky's the limit, really. Um, I think it's a great add-on. In terms of price, is that, you know, would that be similar to what traditional pieces of art are like, or is that going to be more? Yeah, so um, it's, it's primarily, obviously, based on, like, a Picasso's value has appreciated slowly over years. So um, for someone like Banksy, for example, every year, year on year, he increases by 8.5%. So the price is, is a fiat dependent um, in, a, in a way because it's set by the market rather than um, in crypto. Um, but you can buy it in crypto. Um, and we're offering them all in ETH. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's quite good, I think, because, again, fast forward, you can imagine someone having... Crypto punks, a blue, a blue chip crypto punks in 50 years' time alongside Picasso's. Um, and I think it's just different stages of art history. It's, yeah, it's really interesting. Right. Um, my next question is how can we bring the mainstream into this digital world? Because I know some traditional art collectors that know nothing about crypto. They would probably like to learn, but they, you know, obviously value their physical pieces more than digital. Same with fashion. So how can we bring the mainstream into this new world? I think one of the biggest challenges we face is that the whole blockchain topic is very intimidating for a lot of people. And in the last year, we have seen like a massive kind of like adoption from the mainstream, like kind of like kind of catching up to it. But I think still, you know, it's quite challenging to enter. It's not very easy. It's not the most user friendly environment we can be. Web2 is still in a way much, much easier to use. So I think it's about having like a proper user journey where it makes things for people really understandable and it's pretty simple. And I think that's kind of like one of the biggest barriers. Like, you know, we didn't have to onboard people to iPhones because they were so easy to use, right? So I think kind of like making sure that we have easy, intuitive interfaces with, and it comes down to applications, to having the right applications that people need. And this is something that we identified at Lux so a long time ago. It was that we knew like this kind of like having this wallet set up is not the way forward. Like you need to have a, something that is like a decentralized profile that you can manage in a very easy fashion. It should be easier than managing your Web2 stuff. And then from that point, having access to different markets, having access to you know, issuing goods and all of that stuff. So I think it's a mixture between right products, right infrastructure, and right standards, and really making sure that the stuff that we're created is like human readable. And at this point, like wallets and addresses, they're very challenging for people to set up. And you know, I think we're losing a lot of users because just to get started, like write 12 words or do whatever. So right, those, those are like really, really, really big challenges for people. So I think, you know, having the right applications and the right user journey will change things drastically. I mean, think of when uh, I always remember when I was, I would go to Blockbuster as like a kid and get the AOL CDs to get the new like dial up internet and then your mom would get on the phone and kick you off the, like pick it up and knock it out and then you'd have to re-download the movie all night. So. Think of how ridiculous it was just to get onto the internet back then and you had one central authority. The UI UX is horrible right now for anything blockchain. Unless you've been in it for a bit, it's, it's a pain in the butt. There's five or six different steps just to buy a piece of art. Um, that's all, I mean, we're watching, they're saying the brain drain from these Web2 companies. They're all coming, they're all around us here, coming to these companies. And I just saw like a, a really cool app finally where these companies are finally going to make it super easy. Um, that's going to make it much easier. No one's going to have to know what chain or what bridge and all these other things that like we now have to use. You're just going to get on and do what you need to do, and it's going to use blockchain. So I think in the next year, that's how we're going to 10x. 
Can we talk a little bit about security of the assets? Because we're talking about you know, very rare and expensive pieces of artwork. Um, major fashion designers are now doing fashion NFTs. So how can we ensure the safety of these assets once people own them? I think it comes down to education, um, both espousing education, educating those who are going to interact with your platform, but also upon the individual, him or herself, meaning it's very easy to FOMO into something because everyone around you seems to be making money. And that's usually a terrible idea in crypto because it's only a matter of time before you get rugged or just completely um, hurt yourself, right? So this idea of crypto hygiene and, and while the frictions remain and while it's very difficult to teach people the importance of keeping uh, a clean wallet and you know, storing your seed phrases and things like that, I think it's incumbent upon everyone to kind of like actually go through those steps to learn the technology while the UI UX is still so rough and the frictions exist. Until we get to that point where those frictions are gone, where we have social recovery wallets, um, where we have OAuth compliant wallets that deal in fiat, until we get those down perfectly, everyone really needs to take sovereignty because that's what this is really about. It is your personal financial sovereignty. There's no you know, 1-800 number for you to call to, to get your punks back if you gave someone your seed phrase. Um, and that may sound harsh and, and that may sound uh, unsympathetic, but um, you know, when you log into your MetaMask and you sign a transaction, it tells you what you're doing and most people don't read it. Um, so in most instances, when there's some sort of an exploit at that level, it's usually the user's uh, fault. Now, of course, there's smart contract risk and things that are not the user's fault. That's a separate subject. Um, but I think it's incumbent upon everyone to learn as much as possible. Uh, yeah, I'd entirely reflect that. I think with Xerox Art, it's been really key to have a person behind the project, um, specialist behind the project, and have a doxed you know, um, launch. Because obviously, sending a million dollars via ETH is I would, you know, <laughs> I would probably faint. Um, but to have the people behind, you know, can speak to you and can guide you, can onboard you, is absolutely critical. Yeah, but um, they cannot help you. I mean, if you mess it up, you mess it up, right? Like they cannot rescue you from your smart contract fuck up, right? True. Nobody can. True, true. Uh, yeah, I think the, the idea of hygiene is a, you know, crypto hygiene. I think the problem is more people don't understand what they're doing because the user journey is so complicated. And you know you can have all of the services around it, but this is not a problem that you solve with service. You have to solve it with interfaces. Bang on. I think I think think of the traditional art world. You usually have an art dealer. Somebody goes and takes care of like moving the your your asset and everything and storing it and securing it. It's the same thing in in crypto art. Like we're I mean that's what we've been doing too is educating on like if you're gonna buy this, this is what you should do. You should. Make sure it's on a hardware wallet. Don't leave it on a centralized exchange or medium. Because, like, for example, like we saw what happened in Canada where they could just shut your bank accounts down, or even in Russia. We want to make sure that our clients and people that are buying art and, and holding these things aren't going to leave them somewhere that eventually could just be frozen. It is your, that the whole point of this is like you are in control as in this whole Web3 phenomenon. Right. In your opinion, in all of your opinions, how close are we to mainstream adoption with these use cases? Because obviously there's still smart contract bugs, there's still security issues and just educational problems that need to be solved. So how close are we to getting the mainstream involved with these use cases? Because we still are really, really early. And what are the benefits of being in on this early as well? I, mean, I think I saw Bitcoin, or I'll just use Bitcoin. I saw like it has a three percent like concentration right now. So it seems like everyone knows about Bitcoin, but really, if only three percent of the world has it, that's how early we still are. And then obviously Ethereum is second, but um, yeah, I think how long is it going to take? Um, I guess what is considered adoption? Twenty percent. Um, so I'd say yeah. I mean NFTs are definitely in the hype. A lot of people are going to get burned. Everyone's talking about it. It's gonna, we're going to go through the roller coasters, and usually when things go down is when we get building and actually like get down to work. I think blockchain-based gaming will be the great hack and unlock for all of this. And once the AAA game studios can kind of get past some of the poor brand equity that they've had and, and some of the poor goodwill that they've fostered by sort of treating gamers with disrespect for years by taking advantage of them, which is why gamers are suspicious of game companies. They're like, oh, if a, a game company wants to sell me an NFT, that it, 
must screw me in some kind of way. And, and I think that's endemic, and, and that's the reason why NFTs are getting a bad rap in gaming. But I think once the AAA studios are onboarded, uh, and there are a lot of them who, who are circling the wagon right now and deeply researching the topic, uh, I think once they crack that, gamers are usually indicative of where culture is going because they're such early adopters, and I think that will be the moment. Now, to ascribe a timeline to it, that might be impossible, um, but to take a shot at it, maybe 18 months? I don't know. I, I could agree with the 18 months. I like that number. It's cool. No, I like... Uh, no, but you and I, we were in an event three days ago, Rachel, where the audience was non-crypto at all, and when we met a few years ago, like, you and I were, like, First, the only women in that 2017, event. 2017, yeah. Yes. We're the only two women in the event, and like we could barely talk about this stuff with anybody outside those rooms. And we were in this event that it was like a very mainstream, popular event with like a lot of co like pop culture figures, and they were talking about these topics in a very normalized fashion. So I think we're getting closer and closer every day. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think, I mean, 18 months sounds. Quite, I mean, probably understand it myself by then. But, um, but I think that the, um, the key really, because obviously there's a lot of negative press about NFTs, which people in the art world and likewise fashion, I'm sure, um, see day by day. And I think to a lot of it will be the, the public face of NFTs um, before. I think we'll have to get over that before people buy real, you know, real assets rather than you know, images and things. I think it's quite, it's quite key for that to be improved. But I think reputation-wise, like, the technology has come a really long way. Like, from seven years ago, like, you could barely, if you will tell people that you were working in blockchain and then you will explain, it was almost like saying that you were a drug dealer. Like, that was kind of, like, the reaction. Like, you went to school. Well, you're a drug dealer now. It's like, I'm not. Like, they will have really bad reputation, right? And I think Ethereum really helped, like, focus kind of, like, on the technology. And I think we have come, like, a really, really long way in terms of, like, reputational gain. <laughs> Marjorie, because um, you mentioned Ethereum and the advances there, and anyone can answer this if you guys have that technical knowledge. Um, what advances are being made on blockchain networks to kind of push all of this forward? If you have specific use cases, uh, Marjorie, did you want to yeah. go? Sure. I mean, when you know, when we started Luxo, we came from from the Ethereum ecosystem. We were part of Ethereum since the very beginning. So for us, you know, was we understand and we believe on Ethereum as being kind of like that Internet of Blockchains and being compatible to the Ethereum EVM. And I think there's a lot of like really smart people doing research in terms of like consensus and stuff like that in terms to actually achieve all of our dreams in terms of scalability and all of that stuff. Um, you know, but I think for us at Lux, our focus is primarily around smart contract standards and understanding you know, that we need to have, we cannot compromise usability against centralization. Like we have to make sure that users are always in control, that users really own their identity, that they're really issuing their assets from their identity. So we are working on a pretty complex kind of like smart contract orchestration. Um, my co-founder being, in our opinion, you know, one of the thought leaders in terms of like blockchain standards. Fabian. Yes, Fabian. Um, you know, as he was part of Ethereum and he proposed ERC20 many, many years ago. So basically we're creating kind of like that, that nomenclature of like smart contracts in order to, to power different use cases. So I think that's, that's very, very important because right now the whole NFT space is built on like very simple premises of technology that's quite old. And because everybody's very excited in making money, not a lot of people are worried like really fixing some of the key, key issues because I think, you know, what we need to understand is when people say, oh, NFT for art or NFT for this or NFT for loyalty, it's like the NFT itself should be all of those things simultaneously and should give you access to all of the different arrays of utility and experience that come up with it but therefore you need like a proper kind of like architecture behind the nft right and right now we have something pretty primitive which is cool because we build a lot with something very primitive but we need to move on from that and that's kind of like our mission to build on some of that i agree the importance of the ethereum virtual machine is first and foremost in my mind and i believe also a polygon's uh collective mind uh and that's to say not cutting any corners with decentralization and security um, because high transaction throughput, while it is extremely important, uh, should not be achieved uh, at the risk of cutting corners with decentralization and security, because then you're getting closer to having a centralized ledger, which is not much better than where we are today, right? So when I speak of cryptographic breakthroughs, you know, thinking about ZK rollups and other sorts of layer two technologies that will actually increase uh, throughput on the Ethereum virtual machine, uh, 
while increasing privacy uh, and uh, decentralization as well. So I think those are very important things to be mindful of and to be on the lookout for when you're researching blockchains generally. Right, just adding on that, why do you guys think it's important to understand the technology side of things behind NFTs? I mean, right now, NFTs are huge. Everyone seems to know about them. But how many people actually know the technology behind it? Why is that important in terms of making good investment decisions, et cetera? I think right now everyone is like, like a couple of years ago or a few years ago, it was like big data and cloud and all this. And right now everyone's throwing NFTs on their profile. There's a million experts. There's a million blockchains that are now running out of creating a new NFT. And at the end of the day, if you're the one that buys some of these NFTs on some of these blockchains that haven't been proven, you're literally, I mean, these are the people that are going to feel like they got burned and destroyed because they really don't understand what's happening there. So understanding, like, well, first, I guess it comes down to what blockchain it is. Like, I think you're pretty safe if it's on Ethereum because it's the most proven. Um, I would just definitely look into, like, when you see a company that's like, oh, we're doing NFTs. And, and if you just, like, put in a credit card and it just instantly happens, try to figure out what's happening on the back end. Like, are you actually getting an NFT or are they just kind of running a company and using the word NFT to increase transactions and you're just, you're doing the old Web2 way with just the word NFT, so they tricked you. John, I'm curious to know your thoughts on, because you're with Zero X Art. are traditional art investors wanting to know anything about the technology or are they just in it for the NFTs and just the fact that this is a trend right now? Or are they actually asking like, what's the blockchain network behind this? Um, I think it's a bit of both at the moment. Um, I think the, the interest in NFTs um, has exploded, um, right, and for, for everyone. Um, but I think the utility of the blockchain for art collectors is something that people, at least I, the collectors I've been in touch with, are, are really interested in. Um, it's, a, it's a generational thing, so the younger, uh, the sort of 30 or so, um, 40 so sort of engage. Um, but I think the, we're in a sort of period where, like, between the two, where they're, you know, Crypto punks <laughs> um, are writ large, but then they're also exploring how you know how how their collection could be on on chain um, rather than just in a in a drawer. So it's quite it's really interesting, and I think it's a it's the most exciting moment really um, for Xerox Art um, forever. Would you say at Zero X Art or most of the um, consumers are they younger, older? Um, definitely younger. I mean, we've had lots of um, lots of interest in the works already, which is wonderful. I think there's a, you know, what we're trying to do is build a community um, of, of new collectors, um, a lot of new collectors um, who are interested in Picasso or in Warhol and interested in going to museums, interested in all of this. And it's, it's a brilliant crossover um, because you have this community of very interested people um, who aren't really in the art world. Um, so far, they don't go to Sotheby's or Christie's, you know, all of this sort of thing. So it's about sort of bringing the two together. Um, yeah, lots. Right. So where do you guys see the future of all of this going? You know, what can we expect next? Right now, we're seeing these use cases, but what can we expect next for fashion NFTs and for artwork NFTs? I, my personal belief is that, you know, NFTs or some sort of like tokenized ownership is going to be the foundation for like cultural consumption. Like I think it will be, you know, the only way people will actually interact with products, the only way people will manage, manage the ownership of products. So I think it will grow, go across like the creative economies in terms of if it's art, traditional art, digital art, sneaker culture, you know, collectors, whatever it might be. Um, I think that type of like blockchain tokenized consumption is going to be the foundation of all of it. Um, I think, you know, obviously art is an amazing proposition. I think fashion is very clear, the use cases and the utility, but I think we will see it like across culture. Yeah, I think display and utility are up next, right, is, is getting that down. On the display side, you know, so much of cultural consumption is, well, part of it is for personal satisfaction, but also is to display uh, your cultural consumption, right? So this idea of better wallet tools or better immersive spaces, better metaverse tools, right? Um, so some of these virtual worlds that are built on Polygon, for instance, could be ambitious like a Decentraland or a Sandbox where you own an expensive piece of land and you showcase your cultural consumption. 
Um, or it can be uh, in an environment that's a little bit less ambitious, like a Mona or a Spatial or an OnCyber, where the actual spaces um, are not as scarce. Uh, you can sell them on the secondary market, but you use it as an immersive social media device to showcase your taste level and to host people within your sort of digital identity, the world that you created for yourself. So I think display is super important. And then utility, that gamification aspect, right? Um, creating these rewards programs for people who are collecting, giving them a reason to continue to collect and want to collect and build community around it. So those are the two areas, display and utility, that I think are most important. Yeah, in the last, last year, I, uh, when I joined Super Rare, I was like, I'm going to go to Samsung, LG, all the display companies. This is going to be so easy. We're going to just get these frames and TVs and input all of our communities NFTs, let, let them to be able to get them into all the network, but uh, supply chain really killed everything with uh, COVID. They're all just starting to hit the market now. So like, we're gonna start seeing in the next year, like everyone's gonna probably have a frame in their house where you could showcase your art and people are gonna start seeing it. I think the big thing is I, the whole metaverse thing, we all love, I mean, it's really nice to go have a beer and see people in real life, and but like you still wanna enjoy the NFT. So, What's going to be cool and, and what we're really doing is like how do we empower our creators to get them out to the masses so like you're in a restaurant and we can do a virtual feature of uh, women like if it was like black history month and we want to showcase that and we drive traffic to the restaurant um, and then the restaurant pays our uh, our community a fee and we share that with all of the creators so now they're able to take this piece of art that used to just go to one person and get a fee to have it seen all around the world. So that's the amazing part is you're going to be able to get value from all of your art, and it's going to be out at the ma That's how we're going to get to the masses, I guess. Yeah, I'd reflect that entirely. I think it's a lot of what the future will hold, I think, is about the experience of art. So having it that in those... We, we did actually partner with Samsung for the London launch, and these NFTVs are incredible. Um, and, and it's about sort of experiencing um, the, f the physical digitally and vice versa. And I think they're both, they, yeah, it's just such a brilliant combination. It's exciting. Right. We have about one minute left. So I just want to take that time for you guys to say, how can people get involved with, you know, this new world with fashion NFTs, with artwork NFTs? How can they get involved? I think Twitter... Discord and Instagram, the usual suspects are like the best source. So the dematerialized with an S because it's a British spelling. Um, it's a it's a good place to to, figure, to know what's up. And then look, so you know we are primarily working around you know different disciplines, but we are also keeping our, our pulse on the on the fashion and the digital fashion space. So Luxo as well, L U K S O. Yeah. I would say quickly uh, learn by doing and just continue to stay curious. Touch everything. Try to educate yourself, meet people, do this. This is fantastic, right? We all missed this during COVID. So um, learn by doing and stay curious. Yeah, I would say Twitter is, is I, it was talk, I was, a year ago, I was like, oh, I got to get my Twitter going again. Like, this is horrible. Um, but yeah, if you get lost in there, uh, just make sure you shut it off on the weekends. That's what I do to keep my wife happy. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I've made the leap, you know, from the art world, which is mostly Instagram to Twitter um, recently. And yeah, it's, it's a daily <laughs> chore, as it were. But no, it is interesting. But um, yeah, and also a shameless plug, but our website is now live, so Xerox.art, and that's got all our art. So go and have a look at that. That's a good. Great. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks again, Blockchain Creative Labs. It's been fun. Thank you.